Welcome to Excel Business Statistical Analysis video number 16. Hey, in this video, we got to talk about an introduction to probability. But before we talk about probability, we got to talk about experiments, sample points, events, and then we'll talk about probability. <laughs> Now we're in Chapter 4, Introduction to Probability. Here's the list of videos we're going to have in this chapter. But we first want to jump over to our PDF notes. Now you can download these PDF notes from the link below the video. Yeah, wait a second. We're not in Excel. We're going to have to look at some facts about probability. And we'll do that in these PDF notes. Now, what is probability? Well, before we talk about what it is, let's just think of some examples. What's the probability that you can roll a 6 with a die? Well, how many sides are there? 6. The number 6 is one of those sides. So we take 1 divided by 6, and bam, there's the probability of rolling a 6. Another example, what's the probability that a random selected student in my class will earn an A? Well, based on past data, 10% of students get an A. Now, on January 25th, 2022, a casino estimated the probability that the Kansas City Chiefs would win the Super Bowl. And they said, hey, there's a 43% chance. But on January 31st, a Monday, after KC lost the AFC Championship game, well, then the probability became zero. There's zero chance they can win the Super Bowl. Now, as another example, what's the probability that it will rain in Seattle next year? Well, if you look at the last 100 years, every single year there's been rain. So that would be 100%. Based on our past data, we can say there's a 100% chance that there will be rain in Seattle next year. Now, notice something about all of these probabilities, which can be decimals or percentages. They're all between 0 and 1, inclusive. And there's no negative numbers and no numbers bigger than 100%. Now, with those examples in mind, let's jump up to the top of the PDFs and talk about probability. Now, there's some synonyms. You might hear probability, likelihood, chance possibility. All of those are synonyms for probability. Now, probability is a numerical measure, a number between 1 and 0 inclusive, that indicates the likelihood that an event will occur in the unknown future. Now, unknown future is key because probability is never known with certainty. It's only an estimate. But wait. There are two situations when it's not an estimate. Look down here. The probability that KC will win the Super Bowl is 0. Well, if it really is 0, that means it's certain. Same with the rain in Seattle next year. If it's really 100%, then it's certain. But in both of those cases, those events are in the future. What if a meteor hits the planet and rain stops? What if the NFL says, no, we don't want Cincinnati. We're going to instate KC. So because the events are in the future, they're not known with certainty. Now, other important facts. Remember, probability is never negative, and it's never greater than 1. Now, always when I give a test, someone will give me a negative number or some number bigger than 1. Don't do it. Just remember, if you get an answer that's negative or greater than 1, the calculation is not correct. That number always has to be between 0 and 1. Now, another mistake people will make is they'll think that a percentage change is a probability. Percentage change is not a probability. You can have an increase of sales of 110%. Notice that's greater than 1, or a decrease in sales minus 25%. Notice that's less than 0. But those are not probabilities. Finally, probability represents parts out of 100, where you can have 0 to 100 parts out of 100. 
For example, if the probability of a sale for any one particular sales call is 20%, this means that in a random test, you would expect to make 20 sales for every 100 sales calls. Now if we scroll down, we want to talk about methods of estimating probability. Well, classical probability, that's when all outcomes are equally likely, like when you're rolling a die. So the probability of rolling a 3 with one die, 1 divided by 6. But for the six sides, it doesn't matter which one you pick, the probability is the same for each. Now, relative frequency probability, we did that in Chapter 2. Anytime we use a pivot table to create a frequency distribution with a unique list of items, the count for each item, and then the percentages of relative frequency, that's creating a relative frequency probability distribution. So for example, probability of getting an A in a class based on the past data, 5 out of 50 got A's. So the probability is 0 0.10. Now subjective probability, that's when you use expert judgment because outcomes are not equally likely and there's little past data. So when the casino estimates the probability that KC will win the Super Bowl at 0.43, they're using their best judgment. Now there is past data on matchups between teams, but none of it is exactly matched to the unique event of a Super Bowl. So in that way, it's really subjective. Now we need to define a random experiment, and it is a process that generates well-defined experimental outcomes, also called sample points. Think of rolling the die. There's exactly six outcomes. And on any single repetition or trial or step of the experiment, one and only one of the possible experimental outcomes can occur. And the experimental outcome that does occur on any trial is determined solely by chance. Now, one of the most important things in determining probability is the sample space. And the sample space for a random experiment is a set of all experimental outcomes for a random experiment. Now, it's not always possible to list all the experimental outcomes, but we're always going to try. Now, for a simple example, we'll do a one-step random experiment. Rolling a die, there's the sample space, 1 to 6, selecting a product for inspection. It's either going to be a defect or not a defect. Playing in the Super Bowl, you either win or lose. Playing in an NFL game, though, there's three possibilities, win, lose, and tie. Now, if we scroll down, most of the time you're doing multi-step random experiments. For example, when you flip a coin two times, there's two steps. And the sample space is head, 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 tail, tail, head, and tail, tail. Once you have the sample space, then you can calculate the probability. The probability of getting two heads is 1 divided by 4. Two tails, 1 divided by 4. But getting one tail or one head in two tries is 2 divided by 4. Another multi-step experiment is rolling two die, some dice. Notice the sample space is huge. I had to match up one, which is one of the sides, with all the other sides, and then two, one of the sides, with all the other sides, and so on. If we look at a two-step building zoning process, well, if the possibilities in the first step are positive recommendation and negative recommendation, and in the final approval step, you can either be approved or disapproved, there's one, two, three, four items in the sample space. Now, if we scroll down, we can use something called a tree diagram, which allows us to visualize the sample space and show all experimental outcomes. So if we have an experiment, flip a coin three times. Well, three, that means we have three steps. So we list head and tail for step one. And then for each one of the possibilities from step one, we have to repeat head, tail, head, tail. And then in step three, again, we repeat head, tail, head, tail. 
then we can follow any one of the paths through head, head, head. That gives us one of the sample points. Head, head, tail, there's another sample point in the sample space. Once we list all the sample points in the sample space, then we can calculate probability. We can do things like ask the question, what's the probability if we flip a coin three times of getting one head? Well, we look through the eight sample points, one head, one head, and another head there. So three, one, two, three. We take three sample points divided by all the sample points, and bam, there's the probability of flipping a coin three times and getting exactly one head. Now, I created this tree diagram in the worksheets just with typing and formatting. We can also, in Excel, use SmartArt, the horizontal hierarchy, and the old trusted drawing on paper. Now, when you're doing math and statistics, sometimes there's just nothing like drawing it out on paper. Now, here's a tree diagram for that experiment, tossing a coin three times. Here's the table format. And sometimes in Excel, it's easier to do this table format. Here's an example of table format where we're trying to figure out all the sample points for rolling die and figuring out what they add up to. Now, we want to jump over to our Excel file and try this example. Now, we're on the sheet Dice, and our two-step random experiment will be throwing two die. Now, what we need is 1 to 6, and then 1 to 6, and then for any intersecting cell, I need to join together whatever the roll is from this die and the roll from this die. So first, we're going to see that Microsoft 365 Excel is totally amazing. What we're going to do here is build a formula using a new spilled array function called sequence. Now for us, we want 1 to 6. And sequence is asking us, hey, how many rows do you want in this sequence? I'm going to put 6. Now there are other arguments like how many columns do you want, what's the start number, and what's the increment. But for us, we'll accept all the defaults, which means one row going from 1 to 6. So close parentheses, and when I hit Enter, it one. spills the results. Now, of course, that's a spilled array formula. So the formula does not live in any of the cells below the top cell, in this case, C9. Now, let's do the same thing over here, but we need it to spill to the side. Equals sequence. And we're going to skip over rows. And when you do that, it will assume the default of one row. So I'm going to type a comma. And here for columns, I put a 6. Now when I close parentheses, one, one. now 1 to 6 spills to the side. Now for the inside of the table, for any intersecting cell, I need the column header, a comma, a space, and then the row header. Here, I need a 4, comma, space, and a 6. So in the top left corner, equals, and we're going to do a spilled array formula. And watch what happens when I highlight all six cells. It's smart enough to know that's a spilled array, so it puts in only the cell reference that contains the formula and then the spilled range operator. Now, that'll give me 1 to 6, but I need to join it to this 1 to 6. And I need a comma and a space in between. So we use the join operator, ampersand, shift 7. And we need a comma and a space. And we have to put this in double quotes, comma, space, and double quotes. Right now, all we've done is join the spilled array to a comma and a space. But now we're going to join a third thing, so ampersand. And instead of using my mouse and highlighting, I can simply click in that cell because D8 is the only cell that has that formula, and type hashtag or pound, the spilled range operator. Now watch what happens when I one, hit Enter. One. you got to be kidding me. That one formula in the top left cell spilled 36 results. Now I can tell you, if you go back and try to do this in earlier versions of Excel, it's just flat out a lot harder. Now, let's make this even fancier, because it's OK the way it is now. But I really like parentheses before and after. 
So in the top cell, F2. Well, if I want a parentheses before, I need to join something to the rest of the formula, but put it before the rest of the formula. And what I want is in double quotes, open parentheses, end double quotes, and join. And notice it's polite. You don't get to see the rainbow color coding if the formula isn't correct. It knows that this would give us an error, but when we type ampersand to join and hit one, enter. One, one, one. By the way, I have speak cells turned on. I'm going to turn this off. Turned off speak on enter. Now let's finish this. Click in the top cell, and I need to join everything before with ampersand, double quote, close parentheses, double quote. And notice, I didn't try to type this out left to right, which is hard to do. I just built it one step at a time. Now when I hit Enter, that is absolutely beautiful. Now, that's fine right there, just like the first version was fine. But let's keep going with this. Let's add an equal sign and then a total for each role. Because notice, 6 plus 1 is 7, 5 plus 2 is 7, 4 plus 3 is 7. All of these are 7. So in the top cell, F2. Now notice, I already have some text there, and I need an equal sign. So inside the double quotes, I'm going to click, space, equal sign, space. And then very carefully at the end, I want to join it. And all I want to do is add for this cell right here, whatever's at the top, whatever's at the front. So I'm going to highlight. I'm going to do it from the bottom up. And then I'm adding, so I'm just going to use plus, and then those cells right there. And because they're spilled arrays, six rows, six columns, that operation will deliver 36 results. When I hit Enter, that is a thing of beauty, only possible in Microsoft 365 Excel. Now what we've done is we listed all of the sample space. And in our particular case, since we're rolling dice, we're usually interested in what the total is. But now with this sample space, if you want to know the probability of rolling a 4, you just hunt through all the sample points. Looks like a 4, a 4, a 4. So it looks like there's 3. So 3 divided by 36. That's your probability. 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So 6 divided by 36, 1, 6. That's the probability of rolling a 7. And of course, snake eyes. And a 12, there's only one of each. So 1 divided by 36. Now for this experiment, we had 36 total sample points in the sample space. Let's go over to the sheet counting because we want to learn the counting rule for a multi-step random experiment. And we're going to define k as the number of steps or trials in the random experiment, and 1, possible outcomes for step 1, and 2, outcomes for step 2, and so on. So that means the total number of experimental outcomes, sometimes the size of the sample space, you simply multiply all of the possible outcomes. Now, if we roll a die, that means outcome 6 times 6, that would give us 36. As a second example, if we want to determine the lock code with three spots and 10 digits, there it is right there, 1, 2, 3, 10 digits in each, what are the total number of experimental outcomes? Well, k is 3, number of steps, and then we have the same number of digits for each step. So we simply multiply, and if they're all the same, you can say 10 caret, that's exponent, raised to the number of steps. So 1,000 possibilities for this lock. As another example, if a deli offers two rolls, four meats, and three cheeses, what are the number of total experimental outcomes, total number of different sandwiches, if you get to choose one of each? You can't have three rolls or three meats. Well, we have possible outcomes in step 1, 2, outcomes in step 3, 4, and three outcomes in step 4. Now we can simply multiply equals the outcomes from step number 1 times 
outcomes in step number two times outcomes in step number three. And so when I hit Enter, there's 24 possible sandwiches. Man, that's making me hungry. Now, sometimes we have to decide a sample space with combinations or permutations. That's where you're selecting little n objects from a set of big n objects. Usually little n is the sample size and n is the population size. Now the difference between a combination and a permutation is order. So for permutation, order matters. For combinations, order does not matter. So for example, if we select the letters A, B, C, one after the other, and you cannot repeat, so you can't choose A three times. That means we're selecting from this population. Now our little n happens to be 3 here. But notice if we're selecting and order matters, we have to get busy figuring out A, B, C, A, C, B, B, A, C. So we have to get every permutation. But when we're doing combinations, we only are going to select one time. So we can pick the letters in any order, but just one time. So if we go A, B, C, that's it. So permutations, order matters. Combinations, order does not matter. Now let's scroll down. Now we want to look at the counting rule for combinations. That means order does not matter. Now before we make our calculation, let's go look at the sheet combine. Imagine you have seven records. That's the population size. And we need to extract from this set of seven records every possible sample size of size 3. That means we take this set. Then we would take that set, still another set, and we'd have to keep doing that. Well, it'd be helpful to know up front how many possibilities there are or combinations. So back on counting. Now there's our formula. And it requires that you remember what the explanation point means. That means factorial. You should have seen that in your algebra class. When we see, wow, 5 is really amazing. No, no, that is 5 factorial. It means take 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 all the way down to 1. So we would get 120. Also, anytime you run into 0 factorial, that equals 1. Now if we have a population size of 7 and a sample size of 3, here's how we would write out the formula with our factorials, and here's how we'd calculate it. But we don't want to do that. We're simply going to use the built-in function combin, and it does all of this for us. Now the number, that's the big N, so that's the population size, comma, and the number chosen, that's the little n. That's our sample size. And so when I hit Enter, 35 possible combinations. Now if we scroll down, our counting rule for permutations, that's where order matters, there's our formula. And if we want to find the total possible arrangements for five employees in five different offices, well, population and sample size are the same. So we create our formula and calculate 120 permutations. If we use the permut function, number, that's the population size. So we'll select G64, comma, number chosen, that's the little n. There's our sample size, and Enter. Now I want to jump back to our PDF notes. Now we want to go to page 6 in our PDF notes, and then scroll to the top. We've got to talk about the basic requirements for assigning probabilities. Now, number one, the probability of each experimental outcome, the sample point, must be between 0 and 1 inclusive. Two, the sum of the probabilities for all experimental outcomes, those sample points, from the sample space must be equal to 1. Next, we have to define what an event is. We actually already know, but here's the definition. A collection of one or more experimental outcomes, sample points. So for example, the event roll a 7 with dice has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 sample points. Now finally, the probability of an event is defined as 
the probability of an event is equal to the sum of the probabilities of the experimental outcomes in the event. So if we scroll down, if the event is roll a 7 with dice, there are the six sample points. If the probability for those sample points is 136 for each of them, we simply add them up, get 6 divided by 36, or 1 sixth. Also importantly, this is the sample space, right? Probability requirement number 1 has been met. 1 36th is between 0 and 1. Probability requirement number 2 is also met. When we add them all up, add every single one of these, we get 1. In our next example, if we look at the event get two tails in three flips of a coin, here are the three sample points. We have the probability for each. So the probability for the event, two tails and three tries, add them up, 3 divided by 8, or 0 0.375. As another example, and let's go over to Excel and look at a particular sheet. On the restaurant sheet, Isaac's Italian Restaurant has four banquet rooms that are used on weekends. They collected a bunch of data for every particular day, recorded how many of those four banquet rooms were used. So if we're interested in two, wow, we'd have to go through. Well, first off, we'd have to calculate the probability for each, go through and get all of the twos, and then add them up. So if we wanted the probability that two rooms were used, that would be a lot of work. But guess what? We have pivot tables. So we can take this column, create a unique list, and calculate frequency and percent frequency. So back in the PDF notes, that's what we did here. So even though right there, for two rooms, there were 45 sample points, we pre-calculated the percentage or the percent frequency or the probability of 43. So if the event is used two or more banquet rooms at Isaac's Restaurant on a weekend day, the sample points from our pre-made frequency distribution are two rooms used, three rooms used, and four rooms used. So the probability rooms used is greater than or equal to 2. We add up 43, 27, and 8 to get 0 0.78. We also could have added up the frequencies and divided by the total. However you do it, for a randomly selected day, the probability that two or more rooms will be used is 78%. Now notice for this example here, too, both requirements for probability are met. Each probability is between 0 and 1. And when we add them all up, we get 1. Now we want to jump over to Excel and look at our comprehensive example for this video. Now we want to go to the sheet called Retrofit. And our example has to do with a company, Sound Home Earthquake Retrofitting. And there are two steps for a basic retrofitting project design, and then construction. And the goal, the company needs to estimate the probability that it will take one month or less to create a project. Now, past company records show these possibilities. For design, that'll be our step one. It usually takes one or two weeks. Step two, the construction, usually takes two to four weeks to complete. Now, here's N1 and N2, so we can simply multiply them to figure out the total number of sample points in the sample space. Enter, six total sample points. Now, listing all the sample points, that's actually going to be the hardest part. Now, we could do it in the cells. You could do it on paper. But let's try Insert. And in Illustrations, there's Smart Art. I'm going to click this. And in the Smart Art dialog box, I'm going to check Hierarchy. And this one right here, Horizontal Labeled Hierarchy. Click, click OK. And if you try to type in the boxes, it's quite hard. But on the left, we can click this arrow, and then we can simply type out what we want. Now, the labels at the top are listed at the bottom. So if I just click in Step 1, I'm going to call this Start. And we can't hit Enter, because that would add a new bullet. So we use our down arrow. This will be design, down arrow, construct. And I'm going to click back up at the top. And this represents that text box. So I'm going to type retrofit. 
And when I down arrow, notice it, it jumps to the bullet that's indented, and this text box is highlighted. So for the design phase, we're going to have one week, down arrow, and then these are the indented versions, so I can see this construction text box is selected. And how many options are there? There's three. So if the design takes one week, construction can take two weeks, down arrow, three weeks. And here, I need to hit Enter. And you can look over here. I have two lines coming off this one week from design. But when I hit Enter, well, that's pretty convenient. Four weeks. Now using my iBeam cursor, I want to highlight this and copy Control C. Select the text here. Oh, that was tricky. Control V and change this to two weeks. And bam, we have the three options under Construct. Now I would like to list the sample space, so I'm going to come down to the bottom. And after Construct, I'll click After. Now I hit Enter. It adds a new section. And this will be Sample Space. And the Sample Space will have all of the sample points. Now after two weeks, click, hit Enter. I don't want it on this level. I want it in the next area, so I hit the Tab key. Here I'm going to list the sample point, And it looks like one week, two weeks. So in parentheses, 1, 2, close parentheses. And I'm going to say that is equal to three weeks. And so I'll do that for each one of these. I'm following the path. One week, three weeks. That's going to be the sample point. I can see that sample point. So now I come after four weeks, Enter, Tab. And this one will be one week, four weeks, five weeks. Now, I should have done this right off the bat. Watch this. I'm going to cheat because I don't want to retype these down here. And I don't want to copy and paste one at a time. So since all of these are almost the same, Copy, Control-C, highlight these down here, and Control-V to paste. Now we need to amend these because two weeks is the design number of weeks. So for each one of these, this will be 2, this will be 4. 2, 5, 2, and 6. Now we can see all of our sample points over here. And let's make this wider. I'm going to click on the background there and extend the width. And I want to select all of these and go change the width. Actually, let's change the width for one of these and then look at what the width is. I see 1.23, so now I'm going to click on the first one, hold Control. Click on each subsequent one to select all of those so I can change the width just one time. So 1.23 and Enter. And there we have listed the one, two steps in our experiment and all of the sample points. Now let's move this with the Move cursor. I'm going to close this. So I'm going to move this over here. We've listed all the sample points. And now we want to consider our goal, which is to figure out the probability for one month or less. Well, there's one, two, three sample points with a total of six. But here's the thing. For this company, the manager does not think that each one of these experimental outcomes is equally likely. This is not a classical probability situation. It's not like flipping a coin or rolling dice. And the manager thinks it would be best to look at past project records to determine the probabilities. So the manager got these company records for basic retrofit projects. And there it is. We have the design time in weeks and the construction time in weeks. Now we have the raw data we need to make a better decision than just using straight classical probability. We'll use instead the relative frequency method. Now we've been given the data set as a comma separated values data set. Be sure to download this file either from the link below the video or our class website. And save it to that folder that we created in video number one. Now in our Excel file on the retrofit sheet, I'm going to scroll down, click in cell B30. That's where we'll load the data. Then we go up to the Data Ribbon tab over to Get and Transform and click From Text CSV. 
Now we navigated to our folder. We select our file, hit Enter, or click Import. We want to make sure that the delimiter is a comma. There's a preview. Do not click Load. Click Transform Data. The first thing I'm going to do is verify the name, and that's a fine name. Then we come over and look at the columns. Date has the date data type. Project has text. For the last two fields, I can see the 1, 2, 3 data type icon. And because this is weeks, the whole number data type is perfect. Both design and construction have whole number data type. So the automatic steps worked fine. Now we can go to Close and Load drop down, Close and Load 2. And because I've pre-selected the cell, when I select Table, because I want to import it as an Excel table, an existing sheet, it already has B30. Click OK. Now there's our Excel table that has, for each record, date, project, design time in weeks, construction time in weeks. Each record in this data set, and there are 30 past records, represents one sample point. Now we want to create two new fields for this Excel table, one that lists the sample point and one that has the total weeks for each project. So I click to the right of the Excel table. And when I type the field name, sample point, and hit Enter, a new field is automatically added to the Excel table. Now I actually want to list the sample point, parentheses, 2 comma space, 3, close parentheses. So we'll create our formula. And in Excel tables, spilled arrays are not allowed because whatever formula we create is automatically copied down to each row in the table. And now we'll create our formula, select design time in weeks. That's the table syntax for a relative cell reference. And now we need to join that to, in double quotes, comma, space, and double quotes. And then we join it to construction time weeks. Now when I hit Enter, it automatically copies down to each row. Now I really want parentheses before and after. So in the top cell, after the equal sign, in double quotes, open parentheses. And we'll join that to the rest of the formula. And then very carefully with my I-beam cursor at the end, I need to join this to one last little bit of text, double quotes, close parentheses, and double quotes. And that's our formula, Enter. Now let's create another field. This will be total weeks and Enter. I want to add, so I use Alt equals, the keyboard for the sum function. It guesses wrong, but no problem. Select Design Time and Construction Time. That formula is good when I hit Enter. It copies down to each row. Now I want to create our relative frequency distributions. So with any cell selected in our Excel table, we can go up to Insert, Pivot Table, or use the keyboard Alt N V T. It got the name of the Excel table, which is also the name of the query. Click Existing. And we're going to put this in I30. Click OK. I'll scroll over. Now, we're actually going to build two pivot tables. But first, let's get a unique list of sample points. So I'll drag it down to Rows. And there's the six sample points. I'll drag the same text field down to Values. We get a count in the top cell. We'll rename it Frequency. We'll drag the same sample point down to Values. In the top cell, Percent Frequency and Enter. Right click. The amazing show values as percent of column total. Now, these are actually the sample points. So to answer our question, we'd have to manually add these up. Now, this has some use because if the information time for design and time for construction is helpful, then this relative frequency distribution is quite helpful. Now, I want to move this, so I'm going to highlight the whole thing. Control X, and let's scroll up. And we're going to put this in H4, Control V. So this has the sample points and a relative frequency. Now, relative frequency, percent frequency, probability, those are all synonyms. Now, we can answer our question when we have the sample points. But again, we have to manually look through. So 1 plus 2 is 3. That's less than 4. This is 4. 
That's 5, so it's not included. 4, 5, and 6. So we really have 1, 2, 3 different percent frequencies or probabilities. So if we come down here, the probability that a random project would be less than or equal to 4 weeks, Alt equals, highlight those two cells, hold Control, click, and there's the formula when I hit Enter. Wow, so 66.67% probability that one of these basic retrofit projects will be less than or equal to four weeks. Now let's scroll down and create our second pivot table. Click in any one cell, Alt-N-V-T, scroll up. We'll do existing, and I'm going to put it in exactly the same cell. Click OK, scroll over. Now we want total weeks. That's the variable we're really interested in, down to rows. We get a unique list. Now I could drag total weeks down here, but it's a number field, and it will default to sum. So let's choose a text field, which defaults to the aggregate calculation we want, count. So I'll drag sample point down. And remember, when we drag a field down here, it's not actually counting that field. It's counting how many of the items from the row area occur. So that's the correct frequency. In the top, we'll type frequency. Drag sample point again. In the top cell, we'll, let's call this one probability. We could call it relative frequency too. Right click, the amazing show values as percent of column total. Now let's highlight, Control X, scroll up and we'll put it in H15, Control V. Now here's the two variables, total of four weeks, total of three. These are the two items we need to add. So Alt equals, highlight those two, and there we get the same probability. Now I'm going to close this Queries pane, scroll over. So in this last example here, we had a practical example where, hey, we really needed to know what is the chance, the likelihood, the probability that a project like this will be completed in one month or less. And now, of course, we can brag to our customers, two-thirds of the time, you'll get this project done in a month or less. Now, in this video, we had an introduction to probability. In this last example, most importantly, we saw when we can get the data, we can create useful information based on probability to help make decisions in our business. We also talked about the counting rules, counting a multi-step random experiment. We also talked about counting when there are combinations or permutations. We also saw a great example of a spilled array formula to create all the sample points for rolling dice. And we started it out by defining probability, looking at different methods for probability, defining a random experiment, and very importantly, the sample space, which helps us get to our probability. Then we talked about the basic requirements for assigning probability. And finally, an event and a probability of an event. All right, next video, we'll talk about logical tests for probability. And we'll talk about and, or, and not logical tests. And we'll see some killer tricks for count ifs and the filter functions. All right, we'll see you next video.